So if you have the version Bible app open, check this out on, your, uh, on the notes there. Dr. Luann Brizendine, who's a clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of California, San Francisco, she wrote a couple of books. Uh, one, The Female Brain, she wrote that in 2006, and she wrote The Male Brain in 2010. I don't know if our brains are just that much more complex <laughs> or just took that long to find. Uh, but she says, in, uh, she says that a woman uses about 20,000 words per day and that men use about 7,000 words a day. Now, there's a lot to be said, and men, we shouldn't be saying any of it about that statistic. But what I want to say from that is that words are a big part of our lives, right? I know you're there. I heard you singing. Uh, <laughs> Proverbs 18 uh, says, you have to live with the consequences of everything that you say. I don't know if you've ever noticed that some of us are born with this natural, it's like a natural instinct to be able to say the wrong thing at just the wrong moment. Have you ever noticed that? Uh, nothing is opened more wrongly at just the wrong time than our mouths. And uh, hey, I just want to say uh, thanks for being here this morning. If, if this is your first time, my name is Mike. I'm the lead pastor here. And I want to say hi to my friend Jeff Snyder, who just uh, told us that she, he's watching this morning from Columbus. Thanks for being there with us. Uh, we're walking through the book of James, and we're calling this series that we're in Achilles uh, because an Achilles heel refers to a weakness or a vulnerable point in someone, even someone very strong. So even if you've been, uh, you know, uh, following, James is telling us that we're looking at areas that can be an Achilles heel for those of us who are disciples of Jesus. And I'll say it one more time. I know that word disciple is not a 21st century American word, but it is very much a first century word in the church. The most common name given to those who follow Jesus. And so when we talk about that here at MCC, we say that, and you know what, I've, I've told you for the last three weeks what we say a disciple is. So I'm just going to say, let's read this out loud together, all right? You ready? A disciple of Jesus is someone who is following Jesus, is being changed by Jesus, and is committed to the mission of Jesus. And we acknowledge, right, that what James is talking about is not just for those who are new to the faith. Even those of us who have been disciples of Jesus for decades of our lives, we can still have an Achilles heel. And this is important because while our faith is first about uh, who we are, it, it's about being who we are, right behind that is what we do. It's how we apply what the Bible says to our lives and live it out in real time. So obviously, we're talking about this morning how our mouths can be an Achilles heel. And my guess is that nobody is surprised by that. Uh, I'm wondering, show of hands, how many of us have said something this week that you should not have said? Keep your hands up for a moment. Look at the people whose hands are not Oh, How many of you have heard them say something this week? <laughs> Go ahead and put, nope, don't, 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 I'm baiting you. I'm sorry, I should not have done that. <laughs> uh, James talks more about the tongue than any other author in the New Testament. Every chapter of his book, every chapter of this letter that we have says something about managing your mouth. And this morning, he's going to tell us why it's such a big deal. We're in chapter 3 of James. He says in verse 1, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. It seems that they had trouble with teachers in the early church. Uh, and, and it's no wonder. In the notes from the Life Application uh, Study Bible, uh, you would read this, teaching was a highly valued, respected profession in Jewish culture. And many Jews who embraced Christianity wanted to become teachers because in the early church, teachers were considered of first-rate importance. As a matter of fact, if you look throughout Scripture, wherever teachers are mentioned, it's always with great honor. Consider their importance to the local church. The, the apostles and prophets, always on the move, but not the teachers, right? The teachers stayed in place. They, they stayed in a congregation, and, and they were given, it was believed they were given the responsibility for instructing new believers uh, on the faith. It was teachers who put their faith and their knowledge on those who were entering the church for the first time, and that's how important the job was. But, but it's even more than that. The teacher in the Christian church was filling the position that the rabbi held in the Jewish synagogue, and rabbis, rabbis were treated with great respect. The very word rabbi means my great one. It was held 
that a person's duty to their rabbi exceeded their duty to their parents because their parents had only brought them into this life. The rabbi would take them into the next life. It was said that if your rabbi and your parents were taken captive, that you were to ransom your rabbi first and then your parents. And, uh, and if your rabbi, if they needed help, if your parents and your rabbi needed help, you helped the rabbi first and then your parents. And while the rabbi wasn't allowed to take money for what they did, they were expected to hold a job, it was believed to be an especially holy work to take a rabbi into your home and to take care of them. And of course, the 21st century equivalent of a rabbi or and a teacher is the lead pastor. Guess I expected a little bit, you know, more of a what can we do for you, but uh, no wonder so many people wanted to be a teacher. Someone said that rabbis were treated in such a way as it was liable to ruin the character of any man, and it did for many. We know from the New Testament, Rome, uh, Paul would write to the church in Rome about teachers who didn't practice what they preached. Uh, Paul would write to Timothy and warned him about those who wanted to become teachers before they had even learned themselves. And he writes again to Timothy in the second letter uh, about teachers who, want, uh, who will teach what people want to hear so they can stay in good favor with them. By the way, the same problems we have in the church today. But this was particularly true in a society where few people could read. And where people in lower classes had fewer opportunities to advance, this was one of those opportunities. It was probably one of James's concerns that believers would flock to this ministry for the wrong reason. I don't know if you noticed that he said a person who uses words from a place of authority is subject to stricter judgment than others. Do you know why that is? It's easier to control someone with the words that we use, and teachers are thought to be experts in the use of words, and so it would be easy for them to manipulate people. They were uniquely susceptible to that temptation, so it's important that teachers understand that part of their judgment, I understand that part of my judgment will be how I use the words that I use. Do I use them to hurt, or do I use them to heal and to help? Teachers will be held accountable for their teaching. The tongue is a powerful tool. And it can be used to do great good or great harm. Verse 2 says, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who's never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. And so what James is saying is that what's true of teachers specifically is true of all of us uh, who are believers in Christ. We all, all of us stumble in many ways and words can get us in trouble. Have you ever wished you just kept your mouth shut? I mean, it's hard to do, isn't it? Proverbs 10 says, you'll say the wrong thing if you talk too much, so be sensible and watch what you say. It's like the shy young man who had, he dated often lots of girls, but he never, you know, was married. One night he was sitting with his girlfriend on the porch, and they were just sitting there quietly, silently, as usual, and impulsively, she just reached over and gave him the biggest kiss. It threw him off so much, he said, would you marry me? And, and, and she very quickly answered, I sure will. And then it was just quiet again, you know. And after a few minutes, she said, aren't you going to say something else? He said, I think I've said too much already. Um, <laughs> the more you say, the more you'll regret it. There is a danger in many words. George Eliot said this, it's in the notes. Blessed is the man who, having nothing to say, abstains from giving wordy evidence to the fact. If anyone control, can control what they say, they are perfect. Not perfect like we think. Uh, when we think of perfect, we think no sin. We think no mistakes. In, in other words, impossible. It's impossible to be perfect. But that's not what that word means. Rather, it means complete or mature. It's a banking term. It refers to a, a note that has come due and has matured. What you say and what you don't say are both important. Proper control of your mouth includes saying the right words at the right time in the right way. And it's also controlling your desire to say what you shouldn't. Our mouth can be our Achilles heel. We hear it in conversations. We see it in social media. Listen, it's one thing to speak the truth. It's a whole other thing to speak the truth in a way that is not offensive. If people are going to be offended by what we believe, let it be the truth of what we believe and not the way we've communicated what we believe or how we write what we believe. Whoever's mature with the constraint they have over their mouth, they can discipline their whole body. We've seen athletes who are disciplined, right? 
We've all seen uh, what them do what seems impossible. I'm not going to bet that you know someone that you think is probably mature with their mouth because you've never heard them get out of line with it. Look what James 3 says. He said in James verse 3, he's talking about how they're, if they can be mature with their mouth, they are developing maturity in their faith. He said, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships for an example. Although they're so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes a great boast. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals and birds and reptiles and sea creatures have been tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So I put this on your notes, really important. The two reasons that James tells us, here's the first, that we need to be careful of this particular Achilles heel because my words, when I talk, my words say something powerful to others. And he gives us illustrations of small items that make a big difference. A bit controls the direction of a mammoth horse. I don't know if you've ever ridden a horse. Riding a horse can be very dangerous. How does a 109-pound jockey control a 1,200-pound horse? It's this four-inch piece of steel they call a bit that they put in their mouth, and it controls the direction of the mammoth animal. Uh, what determines the direction of an entire sea vessel? <laughs> Comparatively, this small rudder that it has. What can, and one spark can eradicate an entire forest. There, the tongue is no different <laughs> compared to the rest of the body. In size, it's so small. It's insignificant. But James reminds us that looks can be deceiving. And though it is small in comparison, the tongue can do big things, both good and evil. And he takes time to point this out. Because as we all know, words can never be taken back. You can apologize. And forgiveness can be extended and received for what has been said. But that doesn't change the fact that the words that have been spoken have left scars. Proverbs 18 says the tongue has the power of life and death. And that's a pretty strong statement. So do you think the Bible is exaggerating when it says that, when we read that? Let me ask it this way. In your experience, in your life and in the life of people that you know and love, have you seen words do great good and great damage in their life? In verse 6, some people use this phrase flippantly, but I wonder how often the words I've spoken and the words you've spoken have caused all hell to break loose in someone's life, the lives of people around us, and even cause all sorts of destruction around us that we didn't even know we were going to cause. Proverbs 16 says, a scoundrel plots evil, and on their lips it's like a scorching fire. You know the words. You, you've, you've been hurt by these words. I hate you. I, I don't love you anymore. I'm not sure I ever did. I wish you'd never been born. You're not good enough. I'm not good enough. Sometimes we hurt ourselves with our words. They can feel like a scorching fire. They can destroy your life and the lives of others. I've seen relationships destroyed with words. Have you not seen that? Marriages wrecked because one spouse or the other or both have used words as a weapon to hurt rather than a, a, a salve to soothe. And often, not only do we hurt the person we aim the words at, there's collateral damage. Others are caught, are caught in the crossfire. Proverbs 21 says, if you want to stay out of trouble, be careful with what you say. Because my words, my words say something powerful to others. But there's another reason we need to be careful. I need to be careful of this particular Achilles heel because my words reveal something powerful about me. They don't just say something powerful to others. They reveal something about me. Muhammad Ali uh, was not only known for his expertise in the boxing ring. Maybe you remember him. Uh, the for former heavyweight champion was also quite a wordsmith. And he had a book called Ali Rap, and he used his unique utilization of rhymes and memorable phrases. When the rap was first developing, it was said that maybe he was himself a rapper, and Champ replied, I'm a double rapper. First, I rap him with my mouth, and then I rap him in the mouth. Uh, his most famous verbal jab, I'm going to bet you can give me part of it. Float like a butterfly, your eyes can't hit what your, or your hands can't hit what your eyes can't see. Uh, he was 
full of those kinds of things, I should say that way. Uh, tucked away in the nearly 300 pages of verbosity is a lesser known comment he made about race relations in, in America, which I still find interesting. He sounded a little bit more like Yogi Berra when he said, nothing's wrong, but something ain't right. And he was not wrong. James says there's a way to tell when you feel like something's wrong, but something ain't right. When nothing's wrong, but something ain't right. And it's your tongue. It's verse 9. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Especially relevant to a Jew. Whenever the name of God was mentioned, a Jew was to respond, blessed be he. Three times a day the devout Jew would repeat the 18 prayers. Every one of those prayers begins with, blessed be thou, O God. And with their mouths and tongues that they blessed God with, the very same mouths and the tongues were the ones that they cursed their fellow man. And in verse 10, James says, out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. We bless God and we blast people who have been made in the likeness of God. And it's inconsistent. And I'm wondering if anyone else struggles with that. You know, we have these nice words that come out of our mouths. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We sang this morning the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. You look great today. I'm so glad to see you. Great job. I love you. And with the very same mouth, we say things like, you're so stupid. Why can't you do anything right? Leave me alone. You're ugly. I hate you. Or we offend our father by using his name in a way that it was never intended to be used. And James says, can fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapefruit bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. In other words, good words and bad words shouldn't be coming out of the same mouth. Jesus said, your words show what's in your hearts. Have you ever said to yourself, you said something, and you go, I don't even know where that came from. Jesus said, I know where it came from. It came from inside your heart. I don't know if you've ever been carrying a cup full of coffee or a glass of tea. It's right up at the top, and someone bumps right into you. What happens after you say something to them? What happens after that, right? The drink sloshes out all over you, all over them, all over the floor. I don't know if you've ever noticed this or not, but when you're carrying a cup of coffee and it's full and someone knocks it and it spills out, coffee is what comes out on the floor. Have you ever noticed? Write that down. You're going to need to remember that. That's really important. Coffee is what comes out in case you ever forget. Or if you've ever noticed that when you're carrying tea and someone spills it, it's tea. Tea comes out of the cup of tea that you're carrying. It's the craziest thing. I wonder how many of us have ever spilled a cup of coffee and lemonade went everywhere. <laughs> or you've got a cup of tea and someone jostles it and there's just orange juice all over the floor. What's in the cup is what comes out of the cup when it's bumped. What's in your heart is what comes out of your mouth when it's bumped. This is why James ends this section with examples of worship and cursings. Both are expressions that come straight out of our hearts and right out of our mouths. So how do we live on mission when it comes to this? Because words are powerful, and that's why we need to choose them carefully. According to the game Trivial Pursuit, do you know what's the strongest muscle in our body for its size? Hint, we've been talking about it. It's the tongue. Do you know what the hardest bone in the body is? The jawbone. Our mouths are very strong. They say powerful things to others, and they, they reveal powerful things about us. So living on mission. For some, can I suggest? No, let's make it stronger. For some of us, we just need to change our words. There are words that we use that should not be coming out of the mouth of someone who follows Jesus. Proverbs 21 says, watch what you say. You can save yourself a lot of trouble. And for some of it's the language that we use. And I, listen, I know. I know, you grew up with it. I understand, you heard it. Uh, it from the adults in your life. You've used it since you were a kid. I get it. It doesn't belong in the life of a follower of Christ. And it just means we've got to somehow figure out how to get that out of our heart, because until it's out of our heart, it's going to keep coming out of our mouth. For others, it's the stories that you tell, or it's what you imply. For some of us, it's saying things that we shouldn't be saying. And we need to learn to 
rein in what we say. And maybe this will be good. I need to ask God for help every day. Because if you're thinking, I can't do that, I will tell you, you're right, you can't. But God can. And that's true in life in general. I can't, right, right. But God can. That's why his Holy Spirit takes up residence in us when we make our commitment to him. Because God can. In Psalm 39, we read, this is King David saying, I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin, I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle. I just want to remind you, no horse ever bridled itself. You've never seen a horse. There's never been a horse alive. They just reached down and put the bridle in its own mouth. It didn't happen. But you know what James is saying is timely right now because we're about to go into a time of communion. And David would say in Psalm 141, host a guard at my mouth. God set a watch at the door of my lips. So as we go into our time of communion, I'm going to ask you for just a moment, because normally this is where we start grabbing our communion. Can you hold on to that for just a moment? Just let it sit wherever it is. I want to make sure you hear what we're about to, to hear from the word. We are about to remember the great price that Jesus paid to cover all of our sins, all of our sins, including all the words that we've ever spoken in the past and all the words that we will, spoken in, will speak in the future. All of those are covered. And Paul wrote this to the church in Corinth and to the church in Miamisburg. He said, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And I'm going to ask that we all read this last verse out loud together. Ready? For whenever I drink this bread, or eat this bread, and drink this cup, I proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Out of the same mouth should not come blessing and cursing. So we remember what Jesus did, and as we do that, I'm going to suggest that there may be those of us in the room, maybe all of us in the room, who need to repent of how we have sinned through our words this week. We have said things we should not have said. We did not hold our tongue when we should have. And we sinned in doing that or not doing that. And this is that moment. That's why this moment is so important. We stop and we remember what Jesus did so that our sins can be forgiven. And part of that is recognizing what we've done or what we've said. And so there'll be a moment as we pray for you to do that, and I hope you'll take advantage of it. But we repent of how we have sinned with our mouths, and then we recommit ourselves and our words to Jesus. Because as we do this, we proclaim his death until he comes again. And so let's pray, and then we'll take this together. Father, thank you for this moment when we get to stop and nothing else is supposed to be going on. We are just supposed to stop and remember. Remember, Jesus, what you have done. Remember who you are. Remember how your death covered our sins. And remember who we belong to who we've given ourselves to follow and how that is supposed to not just affect what we believe but it's supposed to impact and change drastically how we live especially our words they reveal very clearly what's in our hearts and so Father we ask for help with that as the Holy Spirit, we pray right now that you would, as we have a moment of silence, help us to remember how our words have not reflected the kingdom this week, that we might repent before you and confess our sins. Father, thank you for the gift of forgiveness. May we not take 
that for granted nor take advantage of it. But may we recognize it for the gift that it is. And Jesus, thank you for being the price that was paid for our sins, that we might not only have the forgiveness of sins and be shown a better way to live here so that we can show others, but we have this hope that when we leave this place, that we get to be with you forever. And so we remember together, Jesus, in your name. Amen. There's one more thing we're going to do before we leave this place today. And so Adam and Emily, actually, Emily, are you okay to come up or did I just embarrass you by saying your name? Okay, well, thank you. That's all right. Adam, would you stand between Emily and I, please? <laughs> so for those of you who do not know, uh, this is Adam's last Sunday on staff with us. Uh, we've been talking about it for several weeks now. Actually, we've been talking about it for a couple of months, three months, I guess. And... Uh, uh, so we just are grateful for what God has done through you all here. And watching uh, you all baptize Cohen this morning, man, that was just like icing on the cake. Uh, that was incredible. So thank you. That's just a reflection of who they are in real life. And so we have been blessed. And, and I hope that you'll take a moment to let them know that this morning as well. But we also wanted to give you a gift because we know that you're getting ready to go to Disney. Uh, and so... Inside is something to help with that. You don't need to look at it just yet. Also, a broom and a dustpan, just in case, uh, from this week. But, uh, oh, that's too soon, probably, huh? Yeah, okay. What, what were we just talking about this morning? I don't know. But we also have, Shana, can you bring those out? We also wanted to make the trip really special for Cohen and Emery as well. And so our children's ministry have packed them up so that they are both ready uh, for this trip. Man, there is nothing like a sugared up child going into <laughs> Disney. Am I right? I am right. So uh, thank you all very much. We love you. Well, we, uh, yeah, no, that's okay. That is very much okay. Well, we, we're, I tell you what, won't we all stand together? We're going to close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for how we see your reflection in each other's lives. And we hear your voice speak to us. We hear your laughter ring in our ears through each other's. So God, thanks for Adam and Emily and how you have used them here. Thank you for how they have reached into our lives, uh, that actually you have reached into our lives through them. And God, thanks for their kids who have got to grow up here seeing uh, what it looks like to be part of a, of a church family and, uh, and the, how that is a reflection of the family that they have at home. And God, we just pray that you'll continue to bless them and strengthen them. And we just are grateful for them. So thank you. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.